This week's episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Use the coupon code Rollins to get 10% off your purchase of a website or domain. Franchise savior quarterback is one of the oldest storylines in the book, one filled with hopes and dreams of success, but oftentimes ends with pain and anguish. Drew Locke and the Denver Broncos are still just in the early chapters. After being drafted 42nd overall in the 2019 draft, Locke sat and watched quarterbacks Joe Flacco and Brandon Allen combine for a 3-8 record. Then, in week 13, he took over and everything seemed to change. The Broncos finished the year with an impressive 4-1 record and Locke passed for 1,020 yards, 7 touchdowns, and 3 interceptions. Heading into the offseason, John Elway in the front office saddled up that momentum and bolstered both sides of the ball with dynamic talent. What was a rebuilding roster now is a playoff caliber roster, but there's still one glaring question. Do they have a playoff caliber quarterback? Charting Drew Locke's film from this five-game sample was a bit of a roller coaster. While he's raw and unpolished, he has several qualities that set him apart from other young quarterbacks. He has plus arm strength and talent, which he uses to drive balls deep down the field, and a gunslinger's mentality to consistently push throws into tight windows and zone coverage. Despite the Broncos' bottom 10 ranked offensive line, he was sacked only 3.1% of the time, which was tied with Drew Brees for the lowest in the NFL. In fact, Locke and Flacco were both pressured exactly 36% of the time, but Flacco was sacked 9% and Locke the aforementioned 3.1. When under pressure, Locke had the lowest sack rate of anybody in the NFL. His instinctive ability to feel and evade the pass rush created positive plays that kept the Broncos in manageable down and distances. At times, he would beat the blitz with pre-snap recognition and a quick release, but too often, he relied on his mobility, which left plays on the field and created bad habits. Let's start with a positive example of his ability to evade pressure. In his first game against the Chargers, it was pretty obvious he wasn't totally ready. There were a couple of ugly looking plays, but almost immediately, he flashed that eyebrow raising potential. In his first quarter ever on third and eight, the Broncos are pushing the high red zone. They line up and gun far trips left with three receivers up top and a running back and flanked receiver at the bottom. The Chargers are showing blitz paired with a man coverage look and a deep safety in the middle of the field. These pre-snap indicators tell Locke he'll have his receiver Cortland Sutton on a fade one-on-one -on -one against cornerback Casey Hayward because the middle of the field safety won't be able to cover all this ground. This is a relatively simple read if he wants to go at Hayward, who by the way is no joke, but Locke is always in attack mode. The Chargers do blitz and get immediate penetration, but it doesn't phase him whatsoever. He makes a wow touch throw showcasing his arm talent and drops the ball in perfect. Taking a look from the end zone angle, we can see how he shredded this somewhat exotic blitz. With seven potential rushers near the box, which includes Derwin James off the screen, the Broncos have just six blockers, so Locke knows he might have to throw hot if they bring all seven. The Chargers are mugging the A-gaps, which means they have a defender to either side of the center. This usually calls for the running back, here Royce Freeman, to jump inside to help protect the interior of the line. Freeman does just that. He's assigned to safety Adrian Phillips, but since the Chargers are using what's called a coffee house blitz, Phillips is going to fake like he's dropping into coverage for a sec, then fly in. When Freeman sees him drop back, he turns his attention outside to the blitzing Derwin James. He does a good job of dueling both rushers. He feels Phillips coming back up the middle, and as all good blockers do, he blocks the most inside threat since that rusher is closest to the quarterback. Locke has to feel all of this and trust Freeman to move back to block Phillips instead of James. This gives him just enough time to get the throw off, and against really the tightest coverage possible, throws an absolute dime. His ability to evade the rush and not get sacked is really one of his greatest strengths. But while charting those first few games, I was worried it would actually become his downfall. When he was pressured, he would way too often start drifting outside and to his left. This caused poor footwork, created unnecessary pressure, and left several big plays on the field. On a third and six, the Broncos call their drift stock concept, with Cortland Sutton running what they call a drift off route, which is really just a post and go double move. 
It's coached as a post route to 10 yards, and on your fourth step, you burst back up field. This is paired with a stock rail route, which in third down situations converts to a hitch wheel. Sutton gets a corner and a safety guarding him, but since they're guarding the sticks, he bursts past both of them over the top. However, Locks rolled out of the pocket instead of letting the play develop, and fails to capitalize on Sutton coming free. This has raw, inexperienced rookie written all over it. At the snap, Locke feels the tackle speed to power move almost immediately, but there's no pressure up the middle or to his left. This is a good rep from the line which has created a pocket for him to step up into. He should hitch and climb up into the pocket to create forward momentum while the concept develops downfield. But instead, he gets antsy, drifts to his left, and if there was any kind of pressure from that side, would have walked into an unnecessary sack. This is an example of a young quarterback lacking polish, and a flaw that if not fixed, could wipe out potential no matter how high. It happened here and there the next week against the Texans, but he still turned in a stellar 300-yard, three-touchdown performance in an upset road victory against a playoff-bound team. On 3rd and 12, this time in the red zone, Locke gets a pre-snap man coverage indicator. Not only is the defense tight to the line of scrimmage, but Freeman, the running back, is flexed out with a linebacker across from him. This looks like cover one rat, a coverage we've talked about plenty of times before. Man coverage on each receiver, with a deep safety and underneath defender playing zones in the middle of the field. The Broncos have an all-vertical concept on the left side, so if Locke is going to take a shot, he'll want to target Tim Patrick up the sideline, away from the middle of the field safety. But as Locke gets set, the underneath safety starts to roll to a deep half look, which would indicate cover two man with two deep safeties instead of one. The Texans want to give safety help to their two corners guarding Cortland Sutton and Deshaun Hamilton. This opens the middle of the field. The other safety is still sitting dead center, but him sitting here in the middle of the field while the other safety plays a deep half isn't really a thing. All Locke has to do is confirm the safety rolls away from the middle of the field like he should, which changes his read from Patrick to tight end Noah Fant, who's now uncapped up the middle. Right before the snap, the safety does exactly what's expected. Locke snaps his eyes to Fant, and the moment his back foot hits on his three-step drop, with perfect timing, he fires a laser to a tightly covered Fant. This is another play with a fairly simple read based on the coverage, but a throw with a pretty high degree of difficulty. Fant and Locke have to read the coverage post-snap in the same manner and be on the same page. Locke watches the safety roll away, and instead of Fant running vertical straight up the seam, he bends his route towards that now empty middle of the field hole. Locke doesn't drift in the pocket at all. He plants his foot and rips a seed right over the defender's head. After that 2-0 start, the Broncos flew to Kansas City for a date with the future Super Bowl champs. If that wasn't daunting enough already, it also happened to be in the middle of an icy snow blizzard. Locke had a predictably difficult day. The Chiefs blitzed an insane 21 times, and the Broncos lost 23-3. In the first half, those same drifting in the pocket issues popped up multiple times. On 3rd and 10, the Broncos motion to a tray 3x1 formation, and when nobody follows the receiver, it tells Locke it's likely zone coverage. Right before the snap, the Chiefs try and mess with his read and shift their coverage to a Tampa 2 zone, with a corner underneath, a deep half safety over the top, and a middle of the field defender eyeing the strong side of the formation. The Broncos call their chase concept, which is a vertical from the number one receiver and a chase route from the three, where this receiver will take a slight angle inside, then at 12 to 15 yards, speed break back out. Locke does an impressive job reading the tricky post-snap look. He keys the underneath corner to determine his throw. He'll either sit in his spot and jump the chase route, or carry the vertical up the sideline. He carries the vertical, which gives Locke a tiny window to fit in the pass. But instead of moving up in the pocket to create forward momentum and drive his throw, he falls off and misses wide. Defensive coordinators create heat maps that track the QB's launch point, monitoring where he is every time he throws so they can design pressures to attack that area. If Locke is consistently drifting to the left, defenses are going to make him pay. He feels this TT stun up the middle and starts to drift, but there's no actual penetration. There's no reason for him to be moving away from the heart of the pocket. This is a very difficult throw, and in a frickin' blizzard. He needs to set his feet and power this ball into the tiny window, but when a quarterback drifts while throwing, it affects his accuracy. You need to have your head, shoulders, hips, and feet pointed at your target to create consistent accuracy. 
accuracy, but if any of those parts are pulling to one side, that accuracy will erode. You'll lose power on your throw, and the ball isn't going to go where you want it to. Locke still generates some pretty good zip, but he misses to the same side his momentum was pulling him. At this point in my evaluation, I was about ready to write Locke off as a talented but inconsistent young QB, and with this footwork, was going to struggle to ever make it. But then at halftime, everything just seemed to change. He wasn't drifting to that left side anymore. He was sturdier, stronger in the pocket, and though he already played with a ton of confidence, it began to show within the pocket. On third and two, the Broncos have Sutton outside on a hitch route. The Chiefs are showing blitz with five on the line and a linebacker behind him. They've dialed up what's called a creeper or simulated pressure. Regular blitzes are defined as five or more defenders rushing the quarterback, but creeper blitzes only bring four. Generally, the four down linemen rush because that's their job. So if the QB sees a second level player like a linebacker or safety come up the middle, that usually means the defense is blitzing, speeding up his internal clock. Creepers have all the benefits of a blitz in terms of creating that stress, without the negative of sacrificing a coverage player like blitzing usually does. You can see Locke watch that linebacker come through the middle, but he doesn't roll out into pressure. He doesn't drift in the pocket. He sets his feet, anticipates Sutton coming open even before he breaks off the route, and picks up the first down. After that first half of the Chiefs game, I saw the light. I saw a quarterback with not only immense potential, but an actual path to reach that potential. He maintained his improved footwork and mechanics through week 16 against the Lions and again in week 17 against the Raiders, finishing out 2-0. In the second quarter, the Broncos are running their flag concept from a stacked receiver alignment. Sutton is running what they call a flag route, where he'll stem inside, push vertical to 10 yards, then roll to 16, while Hamilton runs a drag China route. The Raiders are running a form of Nick Saban's split field quarters coverage. They have a stack call where the two defenders will banjo the receivers to protect against bumping into each other on a switch release. Banjoing is when the inside corner takes whoever is the inside releasing receiver and the outside corner takes whoever releases outside. Banjoing receivers is an effective approach and takes away some of the strengths of the offense, but like every coverage, it has its weaknesses. Locke identifies what they're doing almost immediately. If they were in straight man coverage, the outside corner would have outside leverage on Sutton and could undercut the flag route. But because they banjo, the inside corner has inside leverage giving Sutton the advantage. Locke sees that leverage advantage, and even though the pass is a bit inside, makes a high quality throw deep down the field. The Raiders were forcing pressure into Locke's face all game long, but instead of drifting around like before, he sat in the middle of the pocket and maintained his downhill momentum towards his receiver. The Raiders get some late pressure on him, but if he was drifting further towards the left like before, he runs straight into his tackle. Instead, his entire body is moving towards his target, and he makes an accurate big-time throw. I thought I had Locke pegged through his first two and a half games, but what he did in the next two and a half really impressed me. Now, I'm not saying he's done developing or a finished product, not even close, but all this improvement in just a five game sample size shows just what kind of a talent he truly can be. I mean, he wasn't even allowed to audible until week 16. He still needs to learn how to do that to manipulate the defense pre-snap and make checks to get his line into the right protection. He is raw as hell. But the fact he put up solid numbers while being that raw and figuring it out on the fly should give Broncos fans some serious hope. I have them as a playoff team in 2020, considering all of the improvements they made in the offseason, the top flight defense, electric young receiving threats, and an old grizzled Vic Fangio trying to prove himself as a head coach, the Broncos with Drew Locke are loaded. I want to give a huge shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's episode. Before they even started sponsoring this show, Squarespace was my first choice when I decided to create a website. As I've dived deeper and deeper into the intricacies of building and optimizing my site, I've been really surprised how in-depth Squarespace goes. There are 110 different design templates, so you can find one that fits perfect just for you. There are blog options, e-commerce store options, and there is award-winning customer service for each step of the way in every area. Everything is set up for you to build the perfect site. If you want to take your business or even side hustle to that next next level, you can head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Rollins to save 10% off your purchase of a website or domain. Thanks again to Squarespace for the sponsorship. 
Thanks for listening to the ad and watching this episode. I have some huge news to announce. Next week's episode, I'll be joined by Bears wide receiver Allen Robinson. We'll be breaking down his film together and talking about all the little details and secrets on how he plays the wide receiver position at such a high level. As a thank you to my Patreon supporters, I made a spot on the page where you can ask A-Rob questions, and I'll choose one and ask him on the show. So, if you want to ask him something, click this little orange square on the screen to join the page, and I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with. So yeah, alright, A-Rob next week, this upcoming Saturday. Until then, see ya!